I'm Walter Cronkite. This is the most impregnable natural defense position in Europe. It is held by the Germans. This is Cassini. This is the hard core, the keystone of the German defense fortifications across Italy, the Gustav Line. Two commanders faced each other at Cassino, German General Fridolin von Sanger and American General Mark Clark. Certainly the Gustav Line offered itself for temporary defense at least as it had been a defensive line all through history because it's a typical one with strongholds like the Abbey overlooking the whole of the battlefield right up to the sea and almost to Naples. I fought in three wars, World War I, World War II, and the Korean War. And it seemed to me they always saved the mountains for me to fight in. And I've looked at many a mountain, but never have I seen one more deadly or fierce looking than Monte Cassino as it stared down our throats. The Germans holding it had all the observation. They could look in all directions and see every move that we made. And it was essential that if we advanced up the Leary Valley on the road to Rome, that we had to take it. This is our story, Battle of Cassino. Monte Cassino today, founded in 529 by St. Benedict, still enduring, a bridge of culture from the old world to the new, the historic observation post on the road to Rome. The monastery in the autumn of 1943, destroyed twice in past centuries because of its strategic value, once more this peaceful sanctuary for prayer and scholarship lies in the path of an army driving toward Rome the American Fifth Army of Mark Clark. The monastery's ancient treasures are brought by German trucks to Rome. The monks protest to Nazi officers in vain. They too must leave. Only the aged abbot and a small caretaking party are allowed to stay in the monastery. Trucks bring the priceless heritage of the past to safety, except for several crates which will wind up in Germany. But for the handwritten copies shipped to Rome, most of the original works of Cicero, Horace, Ovid, Virgil, and Seneca would be lost to the world. advances, the mountain is heavily fortified. Hitler orders Monte Cassino, the road blocked to Rome, defended to the death. If it falls, von Sanger knows the entire Gustav line will crumble. In order to be able to build the main line as a defensive one, you have to defend yourself with uh, uh, less numerous troops further south. So this uh, led to uh, the establishment of what we call the Bernard Line and you the Winter Line, which is some 10 to 15 miles further south, and tried to defend it as if it were the main line. And in, in, in fact, we, we, we kept up quite a long resistance there, uh, which made it possible for, to put more forces into the Gustav Line, who were not bothered by any fighting, but just by building the, the line and, and, and making it a fortress. Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, Supreme Commander in Italy, is confident the well-fortified Gustav line can be held indefinitely against frontal attack. You'll recall we landed down in North Africa. Troops finally went into Sicily, they crossed into Italy, and we fought our way all the way up to the Gustav line. And that's where we find ourselves with the Abbey of Monte Cassino staring us in the face on commanding ground. We then decided to outflank some of this difficult resistance area by an amphibious landing that would go up to Anzio, and from there we would push on to Rome, the Eternal City. 
The American high command is unenthusiastic about the Italian campaign. Heavy losses here could weaken the main invasion across the channel. But British General Sir Harold Alexander, the Allied Commander-in-Chief in Italy, disagrees. Like Churchill, he believes this is the soft underbelly of the Axis. The monastery hypnotizes and terrifies those who must attack. Are Germans hiding up there? Alexander orders a three-pronged attack on the casino area. The Free French Expeditionary Corps, the American 34th Division, and the 36th Division from Texas across the icy Rapido River, nine feet deep, 60 feet wide. The Germans see suspicious preparations down below and guess Monte Cassino will soon be assaulted. They move into cleverly camouflaged forward positions and prepare for attack. It is now January 20th, 1944. hastily prepared, must carry their boats two miles to the river. The slaughter is appalling. In two days, the Texans lose 1,681 men. Frontline troops slowly push toward Monte Cassino. Finally, they reach Baron Snake's Head Ridge. They are only 1,000 yards from the monastery. The Germans can see every move the Americans make on Snake's Head Ridge and fire at everything they see. They have the 34th Division completely pinned down. The Americans must carry all their supplies seven long, dangerous miles under German observation. The stubborn attempt to storm Monte Cassino has failed. The deadly struggle to take the mountain fortress has just begun. In February 1944, the Allies prepare a second attack on Monte Cassino. New Zealanders will now move into the battle. These tough Dewar soldiers, battle-tested in Africa, are ordered to seize the railway station just south of the town. Indians, also veterans of Africa, relieve the American 34th Division on Snake's Head Ridge. They are to take the monastery and sweep over the hill to the road to Rome. The Indians will soon find that Snake's Head Ridge is a shooting gallery, and they are the clay pigeons, as were the Americans before them. The Indians grimly assault Monte Cassino across the barren ridge. A few yards are gained, then they too are pinned down. The cost of those few yards is very high. The monastery seems to have eyes. Enemy observers must be hiding inside. An Allied pilot is sure he sees Germans. This is reported to the commander of the two attacking divisions, Lieutenant General Sir Bernard Freiburg of New Zealand. I met with Freiburg almost daily in working out his plans for the attack of Casino and the monastery. And the longer he looked at it and his troops looked at it, it became more of a formidable obstacle. And certainly it was that. And finally, General Freiburg came to me and said, I've changed the plans for my attack and I intend to request that the monastery itself be bombed. And I don't blame him for requesting all the assistance he could get. I objected to the bombing of the monastery because we'd had considerable experience in Italy in the decision whether we should destroy works of art and whether we should destroy buildings that had great history attached to them. And we found that in the case of the monastery, where it was not used by the Germans, our intelligence indicated and all my commanders that had been fighting around it for so long said they had never had any indication that the Germans were using it as a military defensive position. 
But Clark, under pressure from Freiburg, Alexander, and Indian Commander Tucker, finally authorizes the bombing. Leaflets are prepared warning those in the monastery, the abbot, and almost 200 civilian refugees. The leaflets, stuffed in shells, are fired into the monastery. the ruins are the abbot and the surviving civilians, but not a single German. Were there ever any inside the abbey? CBS News correspondent Daniel Shore questions General von Sanger. The abbey was meant not to be fortified, at least not the abbey as a building. Was it? Not fortified. No. It, it was meant not to be, but did meant you... Meant not to be fortified. But did you ever fortify it? Well, we, fortified, we, we fortified it after the 17th of February, uh, after it had been bombed, when it was no longer an abbey, but just a rubble of stones. <laughs> Now the Germans eagerly occupy the abbey. Its rubble makes a perfect fortress. Soon they are ready for the Allied ground attack. The Abbot Diamari and about 60 others survive the bombing of the monastery. More than a hundred have been killed. The abbot agrees to sign a statement that not a single German was in the monastery and flees to Rome. Hitler fully exploits this as a propaganda victory. Completely bogged down, Freiburg prepares the third battle. This time, a simultaneous attack on Monte Cassino and the town itself. But suddenly, the rains come. The attack must be postponed. The Germans use the next three weeks to fortify the town of Casino. At last, the rains stop. The Indians are ordered to capture the monastery. The New Zealanders will take the town. But first, it will be blasted to oblivion by 500 bombers. New Zealand tanks lead infantry in an attack on the town. But the tanks are soon blocked by giant bomb craters. The 500 bombers have completely devastated Casino. The town, now only a pile of wreckage, is dead. But Germans are alive and secretly awaiting the New Zealand infantrymen. infantrymen don't wait for their block tanks. They advance confidently into the silent town. Who could possibly be alive in this rubble? The Germans wait. It will be a deadly ambush.
constructed their tanks. Now, from bomb-proof basements, they bring them into action against foot soldiers. in the fierce struggle. Allied aid men wave the Red Cross flag. They are allowed to enter the battlefield and evacuate their wounded. Now German aid men come out and are allowed to give first aid to their comrades. Once more, von Sanger has stopped the Allies. is over. The mountain and half the town are still German. Alexander now realizes Casino will never be taken by a few divisions. He decides to launch a tremendous attack against the entire left flank of the Gustav line. He moves the American 5th Army to the coast and brings in the British 8th Army. To succeed, the attack must be mounted in complete secrecy. Cautiously, combat troops are brought into position. Men of many nations, Canadian, American, British, French, Algerians, Moroccans, Poles, New Zealanders, Indians. These are the fierce Moroccan Goumiers, specialists in mountain fighting and trained to kill silently. 12,000 will soon be loosed on von Sanger. They carry rifles, but prefer knives. Men, tanks, and trucks secretly approach the front. Von Sanger is so completely deceived, he goes to Germany to get a decoration from Hitler. Clark tells General de Gaulle how he will use the unorthodox Gumier. Then he and General Anders, the Polish Corps commander, discuss the main attack on Monte Cassino. The Poles of the British Eighth Army will try to do what the Americans and Indians failed to do, take the monastery. Under radio silence, they will be brought into position at night behind an elaborate camouflage screen. General Alexander is finally ready. These are his orders. The French to cut through the Orinchi Mountains. The British, Indians, and Canadians to cross the Rapido and secure Highway 6, the main road to Rome. The Poles to seize Monte Cassino. Again, the key to victory. Follow infantrymen across the Rapido and secure a bridgehead only two miles from Highway 6, the road to Rome. German artillery tries to wipe them out. For three days, the Canadians and British hammer yard by yard toward Highway 6 in spite of heavy German fire. On May 16th, the famous British Battle Axe Division breaks through. They approach Highway 6. The Germans fall back toward Rome. The pincers are closing. The Poles approach the top of Monte Cassino. 
10.30 on the morning of May 18th, the gallant Poles seize the monastery. But it is a triumph of many nations. The fall of Casino is the fall of the Gustav Line. On the coast, the Americans already have broken through and are striking for Rome along the Appian Way. This coastal road to Rome is wide open. On Sunday morning, June 4th, American tanks of Clark's 5th Army enter Rome. The Eternal City is liberated, paid for by those who suffered and died on the beaches of Anzio and on the slopes of deadly Monte Cassino. <laughs> 